So I'm going to talk about energy efficient uh, computing for AI and robotics. Uh, in particular, what I want to talk about is a lot of the current processing that happens for a lot of these exciting applications happen in the cloud. Uh, but there's actually a lot of compelling reasons, a lot of compelling reasons where you might want to move it from the cloud to the edge itself, right? So for example, if you really want uh, you know, these technologies to reach people around the world, you might not exactly want it to have too much of a reliance on a, a strong uh, communication infrastructure, right? So you might not want to depend on that. Uh, another thing is privacy. For a lot of exciting applications, particularly in the AI space, uh, deal with private data, for example, in health. So you might not want to have to send all of the data you might be collecting on your device to the cloud itself. You want to process that locally. Um, and then the last thing is latency, right? So when we talk about applications where you interact with the real world, um, you know, real time or reaction time really matters. So for example, if you're doing self-driving cars and you're you know, navigating down the road and you see an obstacle, you might not be able to afford the time it takes to send the data to the cloud and come back and react. So you want to do all the processing locally as well. So these are all the reasons why we want to move the compute to the edge or into the robot or into the device itself where we're actually collecting the data and, it, and interacting in the real world. Um, but one of the key challenges that we face when doing that um, is actually power consumption. Um, so if you just take you know, the, the typical autonomous thing that we would think of, like self-driving cars, uh, they burn over 2,000 watts of power just to do the compute. Right, so they need actually to have you know, special water cooling in their system, and this is to crunch through all the sensor data that it's collecting um, in order to navigate itself. So this is a really challenging issue, and then this becomes even a more challenging issue as we shrink down the size of these devices. So often, if you want to do processing, let's say, um, in your phone, or if you want to shrink down you know, the robot, uh, this, is, this power constraint is going to be even tighter. Uh, typically on these devices, because of the size, weight, and cost of the device, you can't have a very large battery. Um, and then these uh, typical handheld devices have a power budget of under a watt. But even if you look at today's embedded processors that we typically use to do um, you know, AI processing, we're talking about you know, over 10 watts. Um, so the key thing is that we need to bring the power down. Um, but at the same time, and I don't spend too much time on this because Dave Patterson mentioned it this morning, we know that Moore's law and in our scaling is slowing down, so we can't wait for faster, more efficient transistors. So really what do we have to do? We have to build more domain-specific or specialized hardware to achieve the speed and energy efficiency that we need for these exciting applications. And it's really thinking about how to re redesign the computing hardware from the ground up. Okay, so that's really kind of the theme of the talk here today. Um, and then in particular, if you're going to redesign the hardware from the ground up, it's actually also very important to think across the entire stack, right? So uh, beginning with the algorithms themselves uh, for a given application domain. So in the past, people typically designed the algorithms specifically for a CPU or a GPU because those were the types of platforms that were available to them. Um, but now you can start rethinking about how you can design the algorithms because you can have a custom piece of hardware designed specifically for your application. Um, you, we, we need, of course, new computer architectures. We heard about that this morning, new circuits. Um, and then also it's really important to think about how this computing hardware actually fits into the system. So for some applications, you might also have to trade off things like uh, sensing power or actuation power. So we should really think about how all these things uh, play together. Okay. Um, so, but if we're going to uh, you know, basically redesign the computing hardware from the ground up, we should really think about, you know, where does the power go? What is the key challenge that we face? And it should be no surprise to many of you in the room that it's really dominated by data movement, right? So we know that uh, data movement, you know, moving the data to the compute engine. So, for example, uh, you know, reading from memory for a multiply is going to be orders of magnitude more expensive than the multiply itself. So shown here, this is a slide from Mark Horowitz. Uh, you can see that, you know, for multiplies and, uh, and adds, they're are shown here in the you know, pico joules and below in blue. And then you can see reading from a very small memory, an SRAM is going to be more than a 32-bit flow multiply. And then if you have to read the data from off chip, so the further the, the data comes from, it's going to be you know, orders of magnitude higher. right? So this is in a log scale below. So really, if we're going to try to address uh, power consumption and efficiency, we really need to address data movement. OK, and so of course, uh, let's start with you know, one of the big applications right now, which is deep neural nets. We know it's used in a wide range of AI applications, from vision to recognition, gameplay, and medical um, applications. Um, it's also used a lot in, uh, in autonomous navigation for robots. So for example, you might want to do things like depth estimation to figure out how far away objects are, um, or also semantic segmentation. So you want to label each of the pixels. Is this the ground? Is this the sky? Is this the person? And so on. 
The challenge, of course, is that you know, the, uh, you know, for these particular applications, deep neural nets give state-of-the-art accuracy, but they require several hundreds of millions of operations and weights to compute. Uh, so when you compare it to something that you would typically do on an embedded device when it comes to uh, video processing, which is video compression, so whenever you have video, you're either going to, you know, if you're going to store and transmit the video, you have to compress it, uh, and we do that on all of our phones these days. Uh, and you compare the complexity of video compression to neural nets. Neural nets are at least two to three orders of magnitude more complicated. Uh, than, or more complex than video compression. And so what does that mean? We still have the same you know, energy budget, but now the algorithms are becoming more challenging, or the complexity of the algorithms is more higher. Um, however, there's some nice properties in deep neural networks that we can actually exploit to allow us to you know, process more efficiently. So the first thing, um, if you're not familiar with deep neural nets, the first thing that deep neural nets are just a bunch of multiplies and accumulates. Okay, so it's just multiplies and adds. Um, and so high parallelism is actually very possible. Right? So you can have high throughput. So speed should not be an issue. What is the issue is memory access. Right? So for every single time you do a multiply and accumulate, right, you actually have to take three inputs, the filter weight, Im image pixels, or feature activations, you can call that, and partial sum, and you would generate one output. Right? So that's already a four to one ratio in terms of memory access to compute. Um, and then in the very worst case, and now you would never want to do this, if this came from DRAM, that would be two orders of magnitude higher for the energy for the access than it is for the compute itself. So if you just take AlexNet um, you know, with 700 million max, it would be three billion DRAM accesses. So that's not good. Um, but then there's also some properties in neural nets that we can also leverage. Um, primarily one of them is what we call input data reuse, and the idea is as follows. Um, the same piece of data can be used for multiple um, uh, operation. So, for example, if you take a oops, if you take a filter here and you convolve it with an input uh, feature map or input image, and that's typically what we do for convolutional neural nets, which is used for uh, image processing, um, you would actually be reusing the same weights and pixels over and over again, just in different combinations for different multiplies and accumulates. So that means there's a lot of reuse opportunity there. Um, another example is applying. Uh, we often have to apply the same filter to the same um, input image or input feature map. And so that means that any given pixel that you have in the input feature map is going to be used multiple times across filters. Um, and then finally, we also have filter reuse. So often what will happen is that you process more than one image at a given time, right? Um, and so that uh, a given weight in that filter can be used multiple times across the different images. Okay, so there's a lot of reuse opportunities. Um, and then what we fundamentally want to do when you're designing hardware for deep neural nets is that you want to basically exploit this reuse at very low cost memories. Um, particularly, what do we mean by low cost memories? We mean very small memories on the order of one kilobyte or below, because smaller memories tend to be more energy efficient because you have less capacitive switching when you're reading from them. Um, and these memories also, you can put them really close to uh, the compute engine, the multiplier, right? So it has to travel less. Again, less capacitive, capacitive switching. Um, so we want to be able to exploit the data reuse at these small memories. So for example, you can imagine in, if an ALU or multiply cumulus 1x, the small memory is also 1x. Reading from its neighbor, so if these processing elements that are doing this multiply and accumulate can share data, it's going to be 2x. Reading from a global buffer, which is typically larger, let's say 100 to 500 kilobytes that service all of these processing elements would be 6x, and then going to DRAM would be, let's say, 200x. Right, so of course we want to do as, much, as many reads as possible from this very small memory, but the challenge that we face is that we have a very large neural net with millions, if not maybe sometimes billions of weights and activations, and we need to fit them in this very small memory. So what do we have to do? We need to like chop it up into small pieces and then you know, do one piece at a time. And then the question is, what is the order at which we want to process these pieces so that we can maximize data reuse? Right, and so there's many options for that. Again, at a very high level, I won't go into too much detail, is uh, one thing that we did was try to really classify the different ways in which people would you know, chop up the pieces and process the different orders. So one example is if you really want to reduce the energy consumption of weight data, you would keep the weights stored in those very small memories, keep them stationary for many operations so they don't move. But of course, the other types of data, like the partial sums and the pixels, now have to move through the network, which is more expensive. Um, another strategy people might take is that, well, they're like, you know, weights I just read, but partial sums I actually have to read and write. That's two operations, right? So why don't I keep the partial sums, which is basically used to accumulate to that output, stationary within this very small memory? Um, but then now the weights and the pixels have to go through the network and move a lot more, which is going to be expensive. 
Um, and then another approach is the row stationary approach, which is a, an approach we developed in our group, which is trying to really, at the, at the core of it, balance the data movement of all types of data, not just the weights and not just the partial sums and not just the inputs. Um, the idea here is that you would want to process um, one row of, this, is a, this should have been colored, but this would be a, a row of filters and a row of input uh, feature map together. You'd allow for convolutional reuse within the processing element and you would generate one output. Um, it's called row stationary because the row is not moving. Um, and then you could expand this into um, 2D to basically satisfy you know, a two-dimensional convolution, and then there's further expansion to higher, the other higher dimensions. Again, the main takeaway from this, I won't get into the details of this, but the main takeaway is that you want a data flow that really balances all the different types of data that you're processing, right? You shouldn't just focus on one. And what is the impact of this? So we actually compare this row stationary data flow against the other two forms of data flow, as well as this no local reuse one, which we don't have time to talk about, um, in the same evaluation setup. Um, and to give you a sound idea, so the first thing you should take away is that uh, this is the row stationary approach, which is balancing all the different types. It's about 1.7x to 2.5x lower than the other forms of data flow. Um, if you cut it in a different way, this is in terms of where the energy is going, but if we cut it in terms of what type of data is burning the most energy or you know, how much energy each t type of data is consuming, uh, we get a little bit more insight here. So you can see weight stationary, for example, remember the weights don't move very much, so this green part is very small but it comes at the cost of the red part, the partial sums, and the blue part, the pixels, increasing. Output stationary holds that partial sum locally, doesn't move it, and so the red portion here, which is the partial sum, is very small, but the weights and the pixels energy is much larger. Uh, whereas row stationary really tries to balance all these different data types and minimize the overall movement of all of it. Right, and that minimizes the energy. So the main message here is that, you know, if, you know, we know that data movement is expensive, and so you should account for all data movement when you're doing an optimization, not just specific data movement type. Um, some other just short things just for completion that we do, uh, we can also do to basically accelerate processing and reduce energy. Uh, one is that we know that anything multiplied by zero is going to be zero, right? So if your inputs, which actually can be sparse because of the Nonlinearity and that's used in a lot of neural nets. Um, we, if the input, one of the inputs is going to be zero, then we can just skip the whole reading of the weight, and we can also skip the multiply and accumulation. Um, if you have a bunch of zeros in your data, you can also compress the data, right? And so you can see, so shown here is like the different layers of AlexNet, and then shown here is if we apply compression to ex basically remove the zeros or exploit the zeros in the um, Feature map, you can get to up to a 2x reduction in terms of the size of the data, and that also helps reduce data movement. Um, so we put all these uh, ideas together. This work is in collaboration with Joel Emmer. So we put all this work together to do this design called IRIS. Uh, basically, it supports that row stationary data flow. It has a spatial architecture, meaning a bunch of PEs with small local memories of around 168 uh, PEs. Uh, and we also fabricated a chip in 65 nanometer. This was uh, published at ISSCC in 2016. Um, the main takeaway from this is like really the focus on minimizing data movement, right? So if you take AlexNet, again, so this is from 2016, that's why we're doing AlexNet, um, you can see that if we want to do a batch of four, we'd have to do 2.6 billion max, and that's 21 gigabytes of memory access. But because we're doing a lot of data reuse locally within both reading from that very small memory and both having the elements read, uh, processing elements read from their neighbors, we actually reduce the amount of memory access, so both, both reads and writes, to about 208 megabytes from the global buffer, so that's a 100x reduction. And then from off-chip, we only need 15 megabytes of net reads plus writes, right? So that's uh, two orders, or three orders of magnitude reduction. And this is, again, because we're leveraging a lot of reuse at the small memory near the processing element. Right? And so then all in all, um, at the time we compared it to an NVIDIA, NVIDIA uh, TK1, we had about an order of magnitude energy reduction. Um, so this was basically the first step, but when we take a step back um, and just look, forget about neural nets, what, what if all I really care about is kind of the trade-off between energy versus accuracy, and I'm willing to take any solution, like so if I'm more you know, an applications person and I don't care about the hardware, um, we can also start comparing these different designs. So shown here at the bottom, uh, linearly is the accuracy. This is a linear scale, so higher the better. And this is for an object detection task. Uh, vertically is the energy, okay? 
Um, and so we have several different types of algorithms. So AlexNet and VGG are neural net based algorithms. And HOG is more like a handcrafted feature approach, which is basically closer to state of the art before 2011, before all this neural net stuff really went crazy. Right? So obviously, um, and I should. Oops. I just mentioned, and so these energy numbers are actually measured on two chips that are taped out uh, within my group for graduate students who started and graduate at the same time. So they're kind of, you know, for controlled experiments, pretty close, same process technology. One of them is the iris chip, the other is a DPM chip. Um, so anyway, so you can see that obviously neural nets give two to three x higher accuracy than those handcrafted features that we saw we used to use, um, but it also still consumes orders of magnitude higher energy. Right? So if, you know, just imagine if somebody told you that, hey, you know, I can make sure the computer vision on your phone can be 2x more efficient, but the battery life would die 300 times faster. I don't think anybody maybe probably won't be so interested in that, right? So it's really important to kind of balance these two. Um, and then just to give a reference to you guys, uh, video compression, which is, again, happening in all of your phones, is typically around one nanojoule per pixel. So these are very expensive. Right? So even though we're doing specialized hardware here already for neural nets, we still have you know, orders of magnitude to close. Right? So it's still a challenge. Um, and so actually, there's been a huge amount of research in this space over the past uh, couple of years. It's been very exciting. People really focusing on energy efficient neural nets, both from um, uh, algorithms and a hardware space. And so uh, myself, Joel, and our students have been looking at, you know, putting together, we've put a lot of tutorial material and overview papers together to kind of bring this all together and find out what the key trends are. So if you're interested in this space, if you're new to this space, I would recommend taking a look at these. Um, but during this process, we actually identified various limitations of the existing approaches. So there's still, you know, what are the open questions that we still need to solve? So the first thing is because there's so much you know, excitement in this area, there's a lot of algorithms that are being designed. So people are looking at you know, network pruning, so how can I make the weight sparse, for example, uh, new network architecture. So rather than having these large filters, can I decompose these kind of 3D filters into like a 2D filter and a one by one? I guess it's still a 2D filter, but in the depth direction. So SqueezeNet MobileNet does this. There's also a lot, a lot of work on reduced precision. This is from the algorithm side. Um, but people here tend to focus on reducing the number of operations and number of weights, right? Because those are very easy to count. Um, for, but for those of you in the audience who design hardware, we know that, you know, does this actually translate to energy savings? There's more to it than just counting these operations and weights. Um, and so when you, in fact, you take a step back and think about, you know, where, you know, what causes energy consumption, it's how the data moves through the memory hierarchy. So the data, con the en energy consumption really depends on the data flow. So what does that mean? That means all weights and all operations are not created equally. They don't consume the same amount of energy. It really depends on how they're going through the system and where they come from, um, if they're going to be reused, and so more, so on. Um, and so to easily assess that, we you know, provided this energy evaluation methodology to give you, you can take in a DNN shape, so for the different shapes of your neural network, some input data also reflecting sparsity, and it would basically account for both the memory access and the computation, this is for based on iris, and then it would just come out and give you an energy breakdown. So this tool is available um, on our group website or on this energy estimation website. Uh, but the main takeaway here is that when you look at a breakdown of where the energy is actually going, um, it's going to be not just weights alone. So traditionally, people might have thought, oh, if I have a smaller network with fewer weights, it's going to consume less energy. But in fact, weights are not the only thing that consume energy. Feature maps, both input, output, also consume energy as well. So this is the same theme that we saw before, which is that when you design hardware, you should account for all data types. Again, when you're trying to evaluate hardware and evaluate algorithmic solutions, you should account for all data types. Um, and so rather than taking in the number or accounting for the number of operations or weights, uh, one thing that we wanted to encourage some more of the algorithm side folks is to really, if you care about energy, if you care about latency, you should directly incorporate those metrics into the design of the algorithm, as opposed to looking at number of max, number of weights. Um, so for instance, uh, you know, if your original design, let's say, is this is Alex and Ed again, uh, but if you're looking at the original design where it could consume maybe like a, whatever this for, the amount of energy of the original unpruned network, uh, you can prune it. So pruning it, the idea is like removing weights. Um, and a very popular approach is just to say, I'm going to remove the weights that are large, right? Um, and, oh, sorry, remove the weights that are small, 
because then I don't want to affect accuracy. But actually, and you get maybe a 2x energy saving, but actually if you think about it, the size of the weight has no impact on energy. What I should be doing is I should remove the weights that consume the most energy, right? Um, so what you could do, one approach of doing this is you could sort each of the layers based on which one consumes the most energy to the least, and then you can prune the high energy layers first. And why would you want to do that? It's because as you remove more and more weights, you trade off more and more accuracy. So basically, you want to get you know, the biggest bang for your buck. You want to remove the weights where they actually will affect the metric of energy that you care about. Um, and then by doing this, now you actually get a 3.7x reduction in energy. So this is about a 1.7x better than just looking at the magnitude. Okay, so this is one way of incorporating, we call this energy aware pruning, incorporating energy into the design of the algorithms. I think there's many other ways of doing that as well. Um, so this, uh, in this particular approach, we use that energy estimation tool that was based on IRIS. Um, but what if you actually, a lot, you know, a lot of systems out there, platforms out there are not open, you don't, might not have an energy model for it. So how could you do this for you know, a generic embedded platform that you might care about? So this is some work that we did in collaboration with Google's mo mobile vision team. So obviously for them, they care about a lot of platforms that are out there. Um, so what we did instead was we took in, rather than uh, you know, an, the energy from a model, we actually did an empirical, we take empirical measurements of either energy or latency directly on that embedded platform and feed that in into an algorithm called, we call NetAdapt, that it directly adapts the network to that given platform. So this is an automated process. It would take in a pre-trained network, that means all the weights are already known, um, and it would do, and it would start pruning the network or reducing, like, for example, here, the channel sizes of different layers, and it would iterate around this until it finds something that gives a good trade-off between accuracy and latency or accuracy or energy or both, and then you would have an adapted network that comes out. So this is all automated. Um, and then the impact of this is that you can get a better trade-off, right? So shown here um, at the bottom on the x-axis is the latency, so this is speed, and so in their applications, they really care a lot about uh, reaction time or latency, and then on vertically is the accuracy, so the top, you know, upper left is better. Um, and you can see here with NetAdapt in red, it gives a higher accuracy and, you know, faster trade-off than using things like, you know, the scale factor in the mobile net family or an alternative approach called MorphNet. Okay, so the, the main takeaway here is that we really want to incorporate, you know, the metrics that we care about, so like as in latency or energy, directly into the design of the algorithm. We want, don't want to do things like max or weights just because it's easy to calculate, right? They, that it might actually bring you to the, or drive you to the wrong direction. Okay, so this is the algorithm side of things. Um, and so just uh, very briefly, just touching upon another, so this, sorry, going back, this is a design, this is demonstrated on mobile net which is a very compact network for image classification. Um, but we also want to make sure that these approaches apply for other types of network, for other applications, because the world, actually image classification is a very simple task in computer vision. There's many other more challenging tasks. One of them is to do actually depth estimation. So there's a lot of research recently looking at, can I take in an RGB image, right? So just a regular image you would take with your camera and then predict the depth. Right, so rather than using an expensive time of flight sensor or LIDAR, I can just use a regular camera and predict the depth. And people can typically do this using a neural network. Um, and in particular, they typically use what we call an autoencoder network architecture. Um, it would generate a very dense output. So you'll notice, unlike classification, the output is many pixels, not just one label. Um, and so it has, an encoder basically has an encoder, autoencoder has an encoder, which is basically a reduction element. So this is typically what you would have for classification, reduces the information. Um, but then it also has a decoder um, part to it where it expands the data back to you know, a bunch of labels per pixels. So we really want to see that you know, this seems to be a more challenging application because now I'm not just reducing data, but I need to re-expand it. So it might not be as easy to adapt it and shrink it down because it needs to retain more information. Um, but I can't go into too much of the details, but if you're interested, take a look at this. But we did apply NetAdapt to this. We also looked at using more compact network architectures and depth-wise de decomposition in the decoder layers. And as it turns out, by applying all these techniques together, you can get an order of magnitude speed up. So this is speed on a Jetson TX2 versus accuracy for this depth estimation task. You can get an order of magnitude speed up with, without much impact on terms of accuracy. So it's still pretty close to state of the art. 
Right? So we just want to show that the te techniques that we've been developing are not limited just to these classification tasks, and they can be applied to a broader set of tasks that neural nets are useful for. OK, so that's the algorithmic side. Um, but let's go back to the hardware side of things. So it's great. There are a lot of people who are developing all these different techniques right, to make neural networks more efficient, this pruning, net comp uh, compact network architecture, reduced precision. Now, the challenge that hardware folks face is that there's no guarantee which technique the algorithm designer will choose, particularly if you don't own the whole stack. Right? So if you're just you know, giving someone the, your hardware platform, you don't know which one they'll use. So you really need to design flexible hardware, because right? you have no control of which of these techniques they'll use. Um, at a very high level, you know, the, you know, in terms of understanding what are the key factors that affect hardware design, especially for DNNs, I just briefly want to go to, through a couple steps. This is adopted from the roofline model uh, that Dave Patterson has developed. So there's a systematic way in which you can evaluate the various architectural design decisions that you might have. Right, so shown here is the number of uh, max per data. So this is like computational intensity and then the max per cycle. Right, so the fastest, you know, so basically the higher the better. But the fastest you can go is basically the maximum workload parallelism. How large is your network? How many max you have? Right, that's how, how much parallelism you can possibly achieve. Um, the maximum, that this maximum will be reduced based on, you know, the data flow you select, how much reuse you're exploiting. Um, and then typically, how much hardware you actually put down, how many processing, like how many multipliers, for example, that you actually put down will affect, that will be your theoretical peak performance, right? So if I have 256 multipliers, in theory, my peak performance would to keep, be to keep all those 256 multipliers busy. Uh, but that's not always the case, and I want to show you guys why, right? So you can also, uh, sometimes the issue will be not all of these processing elements will be active. They might not, not all get real data um, for a finite array size. And also, this might also be affected by the dimensions of the array itself because of your limitations of your mapping. Um, often, you might have fixed storage capacity in each of these processing elements that you have. So if you can't store enough of the intermediate data, you can't keep them all busy, right? Um, and then you might not have sufficient bandwidth to deliver in, uh, even average bandwidth to deliver data to keep those processing elements busy. And then finally, you might not have enough instantaneous bandwidth to keep them busy. Um, so this is a lot, of, lot to process, but the, and so basically you can view this as tightening of the roofline model. But the main takeaway why I want you guys to get from all of these steps is that these are things that people should think about when they're designing deep neural network hardware, but also that you know, often you see in specs people say, like, oh, I have this many multipliers, this is my peak performance. Well, there are many factors that will prevent you from hitting the peak performance. Right? And that really should be taken into account. And then so with that, I'll just explain now why, what are the challenges that we have in existing hardware and why we can't hit that peak performance. So often in the specialized DNN hardware, they often rely on certain properties of the DNN in order to achieve high efficiency. Um, and so one typical strategy people take is they build an array of multipliers Right, that makes sense. And then uh, because we said data movement's expensive, we want to have reuse, what they'll do is read one weight and reuse it across horizontally across the array. And they might also you know, have activation or input data and then s shift that vertically across the array as well. So you can really minimize how often you have to read from these memories. Now the issue is the amount of reuse you might get in these particular designs and how much you can use the array depends on certain properties of the neural network. For example, the dimensions of the neural net, so how many channels it might have, what is the feature map size or the batch size, right? Uh, so for example, these are very two typical ways that people structure the reuse, right? So you might have uh, reuse horizontally based on the number of input channels, vertically based on the number of output channels, um, or horizontally based on batch size. Um, and so as a result, given a fixed design like this, you're not going to be necessarily efficient across all network architectures. Because we know now a lot of people are coming up with all these different neural network models with different numbers of channels and number of sizes and so on. So for example, a very typical thing that people might do is they use the depth-wise layer, which unlike other, other types of uh, layers, typically you, know, you might have hundreds of channels, and so you can have a lot of reuse vertically and horizontally. But these depth-wise layers only have one channel. So what does that mean? That means within your array of max, you're going to only be using a subset of the processing elements. So even though you might have a lot of processing elements, your utilization is going to be very low, right? So you're very far from that peak performance. 
Um, this is also going to be a, more of an issue as I scale up the processing elements. So obviously, typically, we're, we want to have a design where if I have more resources, then the performance gets better, it gets faster. Um, but this is going to be an issue. Um, and then also, when these kind of fixed structures, it can be ex uh, challenging to exploit sparsity. Um, so this is what we tried to address in the second version of Iris. The first thing is you need to address this is have a more flexible data flow. So thankfully, another beneficial property of the row stationary uh, data flow is that it's extremely flexible. And basically what it does is it basically allows you to exploit data reuse in any dimension of the DNN. It's not fixed particularly in one dimension or the other. Right, so you can um, fold it. So for example, in the depth-wise layer, you can actually exploit in the convolutional group dimension, and you can even replicate the convolutional groups across your array itself. So you can really utilize the full array as opposed to in the previous two examples. Now, in conjunction with this flexible data flow, um, the data flow is the same as uh, the first iris, what you also need to enhance it is actually have a flexible uh, network on chip for data delivery. So what do I mean by that? Well, so we have all these different choices for networks on chips. So for example, if you had a lot of reuse, you'd want to use a multicast or broadcast, meaning I read once and you know, push it to everybody because I can reuse it a lot. And then as a result, you need very low bandwidth. But now we know that, and so that's very good for this. So you can have, when reuse is available, you do multicast or broadcast. But then we now know that we also have cases where no reuse is available or very little reuse is available with those depth-wise layers. And maybe you know, if you have bat, uh, uh, fully com connected layers with a batch size of one, that's also being very limited. So then you need to do what we call a unicast so that you want from your global buffer to have also high bandwidth. So you want individual connections between each of the PEs to the global buffer, right? So you can keep all of them busy. So it can be very challenging to satisfy this whole spect spectrum of bandwidth as well as reuse. One possible solution is just do an all-to-all -all network. Everything's connected to everything, and then I can be very super flexible. But obviously, that's going to be very expensive, and it's not a very scalable solution. Um, so what we do to address this in IRIS v2 is that we actually use a hierarchical mesh right, to kind of allow us to have this flexibility. So what does this mean? It means that we have these small clusters that are all-to-all -all at the lowest level. Um, and at the next level, we connect these all-to-all -all clusters with a mesh network. Right, so then you know, the, the complexity part is at a lower scale, it's not, and then when we want to scale it up, we scale it up in terms of a mesh format. And what does it allow us to do? Well, then it allows us to have a lot of flexibility in terms of a lot of different forms of reuse that we want to satisfy. So here are the different networks. Um, if you want to get more detail, I would read the JustCast paper, but you can see that it can do a lot of the different combinations highlighted here in the red and the blue in terms of the data delivery. Okay, so what does this all, if you would just tie it all together, what does it uh, buy you? So basically the main challenge, again, was balancing flexibility and efficiency. So by having such a flexible data flow and a flexible knock, you can support a wide range of filter shapes, both large and compact, and efficiently. Right? You're trying to, still looking for efficient uh, data reuse across all and keeping the process elements busy. Uh, it can support different layers, so convolutional, fully connected, and depth-wise for so example. Uh, we didn't have time to talk about it, but it can also support a wide range of sparsity, so you have similar challenges there. You want to be able to support both sparse and dense, because you can't uh, you know, basically determine which one you, the algorithm folks are going to use. Um, it's also extremely scalable, primarily because of the knock. Um, because it's a, a scale, most scalable uh, approach. And so as a result, as I increase the number of PEs, I also see that the number, you know, the speed up that I get relative to V1, which doesn't have that flexible knock, um, it gets also increased in speed up, which is what you want, right? More resources should mean faster. Um, and so all in all, when you compare it to V1, it's an order of magnitude faster and more efficient. Okay, so that's all we have for neural nets. So I'm going to switch gears now because there are things that are beyond neural nets that are also very exciting that I want to emphasize. Okay, so when you're doing uh, navigation, the first thing that you have to do is figure out where you are in the world. Um, so your, is your position, what are you looking at? So this is called localization. Uh, this is also needed when you do um, augmented reality and virtual reality. So this uh, determining your pose is really important, those applications. Uh, you can determine this based on image information, so image sequences that are coming in, and also you can fuse it with inertial information. So that could be data from an accelerometer and a gyroscope. 
Uh, you would fuse all these together. We call it visual inertial odometry. It's a subset of SLAM. Um, and you can see on the right-hand side an example of what you would get. So for example, if you have an image sequence coming in, um, you would be able to estimate in a 3D space where you actually are and what you're looking at. Okay? If you're in an unknown environment, you can also create a map of your surroundings. Okay, so this is a very important part of uh, localization. I'll very briefly kind of walk through what are the key steps so you can see the degree of complexity in this type of approach. So you would first have uh, camera input with your vision front end. And what are you going to be doing there in your vision front end? Well, you're going to be detecting features and then tracking them across images. So think about how you can tell when you're you know, walking into a room that you're walking forward. Well, because certain corners in the room are moving kind of towards you, so you know you're moving forward. So this is what, exactly what it's doing. It's tracking the different features across different frames. Now, you'll notice that the tracks are not consistent across all frames, so sometimes they you know, stop halfway through the keyframes, or sometimes they begin in the middle of keyframes. So they're quite irregular. This is going to be an interesting challenge we're going to face from a hardware point of view. Uh, you also get IMU data, as I mentioned, from your accelerometer or gyroscope. Typically, the collection of this data is much cheaper, and so you get very high you know, rate inputs here. You can go in the you know, kilohertz and megahertz of data coming in. Um, so what you actually want to do is you want to summarize them so that they align with the same rate at which you're collecting uh, or getting keyframe rate information of your vision front end before you fuse them. So the, the key task in image front end, and IMU front end is just kind of accumulate and integrate this information. Um, and then you have some kind of back-end processing, which is basically fusing the feature tracker, the vision information, and the IMU information. I'm kind of combining the two together. There might be some inconsistencies between the two, so you can imagine sometimes, especially from the visual side, things might get occluded. So from different views, you know, the location of these points might change, right, because of lighting and stuff, and so you use the IMU information to help you fuse it together. Oops, okay. Um, and so how do you actually fuse it? Well, you use uh, factor graph optimization. We'll get too much of details, but this is basically a nonlinear least squared optimization. You basically represent the uh, feature information from the front end and uh, the IMU information as different constraints on your graph, and you're trying to satisfy, or nodes on your graph, and you're trying to satisfy all of those as much as possible, and you'll get um, basically a fused estimation of your pose. Um, also, the amount of data that you take in at any, any given time to do this optimization will change, like a sliding window. So you look at some information from your past, but not all of it, right? Um, so that means that the graph itself is also evolving over time, and so this can be quite challenging as well, because the number of constraints you end up having in this graph is over 4,000. And then once you do this, you can just update the state. Um, so we, the first thing we want to do is we want to put this all on chip, right? So this is particular really targeting, you know, navigation for these nano drones, so we can't afford to have too many um, components. So they're all integrated on chip, and this, why is this useful? Because we know that moving data on and off chip is very expensive. Um, but when we move things on chip, then what's really important is that we also want to reduce the size of how much data storage we need to do these tasks. Um, so we may have to apply these things like compression for the frame information and exploit sparsity in the back end. And so very briefly, so the interesting thing, well, let, before, the interesting thing about it, all of this is that we want to reduce its size, but they all have different types of properties, and so we need to adapt how we manage this data depending on the properties of the data. So when we're talking about frame information, like image information, it is dense information. Um, it's pretty structured, so we can just basically apply straightforward image compression, although it's really important that it's really low-cost image compression because you don't want the, you know, the cost of the compression to exceed the benefits. So we do this very small, cheap block-based kind of coding. This is a lossless form of compression. It gives us about a 4x reduction um, in the uh, size of the memory. Um, the other thing that we want to compress is uh, the basically the Haitian matrix that we use in the linear solver during the, opt the nonlinear optimization. Now, the properties of this type of data is that it is structured but it is also sparse. So shown here in, in black is the regions that are non-zero that we would compute on, and then the other parts in white have actually zero data. Right? So we want to build some hardware that can exploit this fixed regular pattern, but it is sparse, so you're not computing on every single um, digit. Um, and by doing this, you can exploit two properties. First is that it's symmetric, so it halves the memory that you need, and then you exploit the sparsity and get another 5.2x reduction in your memory size. Um, and then you can, of course, do the same thing when you're actually doing the computation, so you reduce or you uh, reduce this processing time by 7x. Uh, 
The last type of data that we care about is the factor graph. So if you remember that factor graph with you know, 4,000 nodes, it's actually highly irregular. So it's sparse, but also it's unstructured. So at any given time, the reason that it's unstructured is that at any given point, a given track can start or end. So the, the length of the tracks are unknown, and where it starts and begins also is unknown. Um, if we were to store this all in one memory, for any, you know, and account for all possible positions. It could be quite large, but if we break it down to two steps, so make, just basically add a step of indirection where you basically st store the pointers in a very kind of sparse format, but then the, the values of the pointers in a dense format, because you always know that there's only like 4,000 features that you have to hold, um, then it becomes 5x smaller, right? So you have to adapt your storage style to the type of the properties of the data itself. Um, so here's the test chip itself. This is what we call the Navion test chip. Um, it's in 65 nanometer uh, CMOS. And in addition to being specialized for localization, we still allow it to have over 250 configuration parameters so, so it can actually adapt to its environment. Because you can imagine in some environments it's easier to navigate than others, and you want to be able to exploit that for speed um, and power. So if you put it at the max configuration, it can go all the way up to 171 frames per second. Um, for the front end, 90 frames per second on the back end, and consume 24 milliwatts. And the trajectory error is only about 0.3% on a UROC data set, which is a challenging UAV data set. Um, but if you want to kind of scale this down for real time and then also scale the configuration par parameters to adapt to the different um, types of sequences, whether it's challenging or simple, you can actually drop this power down from 24 to 2 milliwatts without affecting accuracy at all. Okay, I don't know if I can play this with this, but oh, okay, actually it does work. Okay, so this is, I always want to show that we actually, it's not just the chip bits in bits out, but we actually integrate it into an actual platform. So here's the chip itself. Um, this is the uh, power consumption. Um, and then this is the chip again. So basically it's taking in this image and you're getting this kind of 3D position estimation. Okay. So that's figuring out, okay. Not done yet. So here, anyways, just showing that how the, this is the size of the Navion chip again. It's you know s smaller than the size of a quarter, and here's uh, you know you could fit them basically on a nano drone. Um, if you're more interested in this, you can look it up on Navion, the Na group project website. And this is I should mention this is in collaboration with Sirtesh Karaman, who's a faculty member in the Aero Astro department at MIT. So he's a roboticist. So we work together to figure out the right algorithms and the right systems for these particular types of applications. Okay, so that's localization. So the next thing um, that you might be interested in uh, after you know where you are as a robot is where should I go next, right? That's usually the next plan. And where you should go next depends on what are you trying to achieve, right? Um, so let's take the task of robot exploration which is basically trying to go into a new environment and try and understand or see as much of the new environment as possible with moving as little as possible. Right? So what you want to do is basically you want to go to the locations of that new environment where you can get the most information to reduce the uncertainty of the map. Um, and so basically what you can do is just how you decide where to actually go um, with Shannon's is by computing what we call Shannon's mutual information. Right, so, mutual, so you know, Shannon's mutual information is basically you want to reduce, if I go to a place with the highest mutual information, I reduce the amount of uncertainty in the map. Okay, this is actually an approach that uh, is very principled and people would love to do it. The challenge in the past in the robotic space is that it's always been very computationally expensive. Um, but we will show here how you can do this in a much more efficient way, and so you can actually use these, uh, theoret these uh, theoric uh, pr approaches that have theoretical guarantees. Um, so, okay, let's just start here on the left-hand side. Uh, so as a robot, what you might do is you might say, okay, where should I go next to scan? And by scan, I mean using a depth sensor or a LIDAR, for example, to understand my environment. Um, you would compute the Shannon Mutual information at all these different locations and try and figure out which one gives me the most information. You would go to that particular location, and then you would scan it, and then you would have an update, updated occupancy map. Basically, basically, this map is telling you where are things blocked. Um, so shown here below is a video of a race car, a small miniature race car doing exactly that. So this is the mutual information that's being computed below here. So the brighter means that there's more information there. And up here is basically the path plan to actually go to those locations. So you can see it's trying to go to where the bright regions are to get more information about the map itself. Okay, so this is, what, this is the application that we're trying to do. Um, 
Okay, so what is involved with doing this? So basically you have, you know, with most LIDARs you do like a bunch of depth estimations, you scan this beam. And the really nice thing about channel mutual information is that you could also basically process all of these beams in parallel. So very similar to doing neural nets, parallelism is actually really, po really possible, right? You can use that to speed things up. The challenge, uh, so you can basically assign and give them each different cores, and then you can go very quickly. Um, and then once you do, okay, so once you do all these beams, you add it together and you get the mutual information for that given location. The challenge is, of course, data delivery again. So um, we have to store that map in a, in a memory. And for those of you, I guess you guys all know this, but anyways, you, you can't have too many ports in your memory, right? If you increase the number of ports in your memory, the energy cost of that read is gonna be very expensive. Um, so in fact, we will be showing this as a prototype on uh, Xilinx FPGA, and you guys use you know, a, a two-port SRAM as the building block. So basically what we wanna do is that we wanna limit the number of read ports to two. Um, and, but the problem is you have n cores because you want to process all these beams in parallel, so you're going to have to have some arbiter to address you know, the number of ports, the limitation of the ports, but also keep all these uh, cores busy. Um, so one thing you can do is take a look at the memory access pattern. So if we're going to, again, specialize for uh, storing, we can have a you know, better idea in terms of how the data is going to be accessed. And we'll notice here, so if you're scanning multiple beams, that basically uh, the reads of the data are scanning outwards. And what we're going to do is we can actually take the memory that stores the map, break it, in to, break it up into a bunch of separate memory banks, um, and store them. And so we can access, as a result, we can access different parts of the map at the same time. Right? So you have multiple banks and multiple parts of the map. Now the question is, you know, how what part of the map should we put in which bank to avoid having conflicts between the different cores, right? So we actually end up taking um, a diagonal uh, banking pattern shown here, and you can see basically that for any given, each of the different colors are different memory banks, and you can see for any given point in time, there are no more than two of the same numbers for each banking pattern. So as a result, you know, basically I'm not reading more than two at a given time from that memory, and then I don't have any conflicts. Right, so I can satisfy all of these. Uh, all these beams can run basically maximally in parallel without any conflicts, right? But I'm also um, you know, able to keep the cost of the memory low because I'm only using a two-port memory. Um, at the other extreme, an important part to think about and through this work is another extreme, I could have said, well, I'm just gonna have one memory bank you know, per location of my map. But of course, the issue there is that the arbiter cost would be extremely complicated. Right, so you really have to think about how do you balance the bank banking with the, you can't have infinite number of banks because of the arbiter cost, but also you still want to have enough banks so that you can actually maintain high utilization. Um, so when you're able to, when you do this, basically using this approach for mutual information, you can actually scan the entire map. So rather than saying, oh, should I go here or there, I can just scan the whole thing um, and figure out all possible, like, you know, how much information I would get at all possible locations. Um, in under a second. So for this, a very large map, so 20 meter by 20 meter with 0.1 meter resolution. And so this is an or, uh, two orders of magnitude speed compared to a CPU on a tenth, at a tenth of the power. I should mention this is on basically the ZC706 board on a zinc. Um, okay, so to summarize, what are the kind of, we covered a lot of things, but what are the key takeaways for this, right? So if we're gonna design specialized hardware for AI um, and robotics, uh, first thing is data movement really dominates energy. So when you're thinking about how data flows through systems, um, it's really important to have a data flow that maximizes reuse, but for all data types, not just looking at one type of data, but all different types of data. Another is design considerings when you're co-designing both the algorithms and the hardware. So again, we're really excited by the fact that if you, you know, have specialized hardware, you can rethink how you do the algorithms, but when you rethink how you're doing the algorithms, you should really still factor in direct metrics that you care about, such as energy efficiency and latency, rather than number of ops and weights. Um, furthermore, we often will still have diverse workloads, right? You're still, you're not just gonna do one particular, for example, in the neural net space, there's a lot of different types of neural nets today and then even more tomorrow. So you need to have flexible data flows and knocks that can exploit reuse in any dimension. Um, and this will increase efficiency and also re increase the utilization of cores and allow for scalability. Um, when we're trying to compress data and show, have compact representations, it's also really important to be able to adapt that compression depending on the key properties of the data. So even within one application, we can see that um, 
you know, the data can be dense or sparse, structured or unstructured, so you want to adapt to that base in order to have maximized uh, compression efficiency and also minimize the overhead costs, both in terms of the representation and in terms of the energy spent. Um, and then often we still, you know, to minimize the energy cost of data, you need to limit the memory bandwidth. Um, and this affects obviously the speed of highly parallel algorithms, and so you need to balance both the banking and arbitration costs to maximize core utilization. Um, and then I'll just, just for you guys' references, I'll post these slides on our website. I think you guys will probably get a copy of that too. Um, and then we often give updates on our Twitter feed. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge all the people who are involved with this. So a lot of the work is done by my students, as well as collaborators, Joel Emmer, Sertesh Karaman, uh, and Thomas Heldai. We actually have some medical applications with him um, and all of our sponsors as well. Um, also, just because I think some of you guys are interested in neural nets, I didn't do that much tutorial here because we only had a certain amount of time, but if you guys want to know more about deep neural nets, I would recommend uh, this overview paper. It's like a 30-page overview paper. It takes some time to go through, but you can you know, get the, some of the key ideas. Uh, we're actually in the process of extending this to an actual book, so you can stay tuned for that. It's going to be even longer. Um, the slides are available here. Um, I also run a professional education course at MIT every summer, so if that's something you're interested in, I'd also say you can check that out. And then, uh, yeah, we give updates on our research in both the mailing list and our Twitter feeds. Uh, so with that, uh, that's the end of my talk, and I welcome any questions you guys might have on all these things.